Um, I can share my screen if that's easier. That'd so be great. See the agenda. Okay. And just for everyone, the, the committee and the public, the um, the hearing and the meeting will be is you know it's being recorded. Okay. And of those um, organizations that are being reviewed tonight, are there, um, is everyone is here to represent each of those? It's probably. Uh, I think so. Okay. Are we ready to um, commence? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I can give a little intro just for everyone, you know, for the committee, as well as the public, the, um, you know, DACD, the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development requires that um, at least once a year during the, you know, during the program year, we have a hearing to review current activities and also receive comments on um, kind of the funding process. And so our 20 grant started later than usual. It started in March, April of this year. And so this hearing is really focused on the 2020 uh, block grant. We've held a public hearing for the other grants. Um, and at this time, the 18 and 19 grant and our COVID grant are basically uh, finished. And so um, we're close to wrapping up. So really the only grant that's um, ongoing is the 20 grant right now. So I actually think we're in good shape. Um, we only have one grant. Sometimes we have three or four grants that are ongoing at the same time. So it's nice to not have that overlap. Um, so we're here to, you know, to receive comments from the, um, hear a report from the activities um, the committee can ask questions and the public can ask questions. And then we have, you know, number two on the agenda is, you know, comments on just the general, um, you know, kind of public process, which uh, if the state keeps the schedule from last year, the application will be due in mid-September and the committee in the town would start a public outreach process in March or so, um, you know, and begin that and then have, you know, work our way towards a September uh, application submittal. So we haven't received any updates at all about the next fiscal year or the grant year. So we're just anticipating that it'll follow the same schedule as um, as last year. So outreach would begin in March of 22 or just, you know. Right, March of 22, oh, that, that would wow. give us, um, you know, six to seven months to hold an outreach process, you know, do the request for proposals and do everything and give us ample time to submit an application. Okay, great. So are we trying to wrap up? I guess the question is, are we trying to wrap this meeting up within 90 minutes? And I'm just trying to divide up the time for organization for the amount of allotted time that we've. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that would be plenty of time. Okay. <clears throat> so maybe we'll try yeah, to. I'll need, sorry, I was just going to say, I'm going to need to head out um, at about 8, 8.15. Okay. Something just happened. Why did I just go blank? Hold on. When when Becky spoke, something happened to my screen. We can see you still. Yeah, I can't see anybody. Can I try speaking again? <laughs> I don't know. That's so weird. I just stopped sharing my screen. I don't know if that changed anything. I'm sorry. Oh, there we are. Okay. I didn't touch anything. Okay, so um, any other overview that you need to give Nate or Ben before we um, begin and I begin? No, I, I think um, you know, there's now 10 members, um, you know, 10 members of the public in the audience. And, you know, we have a quorum. So I think, I think we're all set. So Just we'll try to have- Before we start, why are Nate and Ben um, coming to us from the 19th century? <laughs> This is this is the background I don when I talk to the historical commission, and it's a, it's a holdover from them. But. Solid. I, yeah, I, do like I, it. I should change my background. I had a spooky one for um, Halloween, and then now I, I just put this on. That was great that you noticed, Matt. Um, <laughs> so, how about if uh, organizations limit their time um, to five minutes, and I will give a warning, you know, at four minutes, and I will have my little timer set here. And we can move forth. So, are you, uh, Nate and um, Ben? Are you representing Amherst Housing, Watson Farms? 
I know that's um, well. Actually, Gail, would you want to go around and just introduce yourself, oh, and then the okay. committee members can introduce sure. Kelly and the attendance as yeah. well. And then I'll start off. I'm Gail Lansky. Um, I chair this committee, and I've done this a number of times. Uh, I am Rika Clement, and um, I'm a member of the committee. Uh, Lucas Hanscom, also a member of the committee. It's uh, my first of these go arounds, but uh, yeah, it's been entertaining. I'm Becky Michaels, um, also fairly new to the committee. I think this is my first one of these particular ones of these meetings. And I'm Matt Larson. And before I even knew it, I'm now the second oldest member of the committee. Well, this is longest serving. You have to be and careful. Tenured. Yeah, I was going to about to say you don't know you're second oldest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we, can, we can go around, but we could leave that for another day too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and then Gail, I, I had mentioned to uh, Lori Millman that they could go first because they, they have a time constraint. If that's right. okay, okay with you. Sure, I didn't know if you were gonna do um, capital first and then get to social service, but yes, I did understand that Lori had a commitment. So Lori Millman from the Center of New Americans, you are on, the timer is um, going. Hold on, man, let's, uh, Lori, we'll let you, uh, you can unmute yourself again and then let us know if there's anyone else here Great. from the Center for New America, um, you can raise your hand or. I uh, think I have a student, Su Cheng King, who might be with us. Su sure, Cheng okay, is yep, we'll allow. So why don't we let Su Cheng say a few words and then if you let me screen share, I can share a PowerPoint. That way Su Cheng can go back to her family. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, Ben, do you wanna, can you, Lori would have to become a panelist to share the screen you think or? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, All right, so Su Cheng, you, you, you can uh, unmute yourself and speak. Yeah. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Su Jane. I'm from Cambodia. And nice to meet you. Um, I have been in the United States for two years. And I have learned English at Center for New American. Almost two years too. And I, I had finished nurse at, at Center for New American. I, Right now, I live in Amherst with my family, and I really thank to all of you and Center for New American for help my whole family. And CNA help me all everything, like um, um, finding a job, insurance, Wi-Fi babysitter, tutor, teacher, and especially nurse ed training class. And that, that this is important to me. And have discuss and resolve all about the problem. And help all immigrant people. Um, I really thank to you all. Thank you, Su Cheng. Yes. So I'm just going to quickly show a PowerPoint presentation that will give you an update on this past year. And Su Cheng, I'm fine with you going back to your family. I, I, um, Su Cheng was a nurse in Cambodia. And so recredentialing as a nurse aide here in the United States was important to her um, so that she could get a job while she um, figures out whether or not she wants to recredential as a nurse. So as everyone knows, as Su Cheng said, we teach English for speakers of other languages. And this past year, we have been both hybrid, so partly in person and partly online. And in Amherst, we're offering four levels of class from pre-literate to high intermediate. Um, during the pandemic, we welcomed quite a few refugee families into our Amherst classes. And now we are welcoming Afghan evacuees there are 20 um, Afghan evacuees currently living in Amherst and they are coming into our classes. Um, this is the nurse aid training that Su Cheng was referring to. And this is this past year's class 
doing their clinical training after they finished their um, classroom training at Smith Volk. They were at CARE One. Um, we celebrated students' artistic traditions um, with our celebration of the arts in the spring, like we always do online again this year. Um, our students have gotten good jobs. Su Cheng said that we helped her to get a job, but we've also helped quite a few other students get jobs. The student below, also an Amherst resident, is employed at Cooley Dickinson. Um, I've spoken before about the alumna that we have at the Musanti Health Center. And now we have another student who's working there as well. And three of the refugee students um, that we helped to um, resettle are now working at Trinity Solar because it was their job, their dream to do um, solar installing. Um, our students have enrolled in and graduated from college. Um, we have distributed a lot of emergency relief aid, as I've spoken about before. So that translated to paying people's rent and utilities and buying food cards. Of course, in this online arena, we've also purchased and loaned tablets and hotspots and installed Comcast in two homes in Amherst, where there were so many people trying to zoom in that a hotspot wouldn't do it. Um, we coached over 65 immigrants through naturalization last year. Um, and continue to offer both TPS, especially to Haitian immigrants and DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, and so what really what that all boils down to is creating access for people. And in that context, we also began a diversity, equity and inclusion initiative. It's been funded by the Beverage Foundation um, and it is being led by our staff and our alumni. We don't take anything for granted. We leverage all of our grants with fundraising and 30 Poems in November is um, our annual fundraiser. We're right in the middle of it. And we have already exceeded this year's goal of $65,000. And in their own words, like Su Cheng said, um, our program helps people achieve their goals. Some of you may know Glennis Daly. You may have seen her at the mobile market where she works in Amherst. She was one of our students for many years. She was one of our clients and she became a US citizen um, on Monday, uh, on last week, I'm sorry, on the 10th and posted this ecstatic message on Facebook. Um, and thank you for giving me a chance to give you an update on our program. I hope I'm within the, um, within the limit. 25 seconds to spare, nicely done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody yeah. have any questions for Lori? Um, I was very interested to hear about the um, um, newly arrived Afghan uh, families and uh, how you are serving them. Uh, do you see a larger pipeline coming down or yes. are you? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we have only about half of them here already and we are scrambling as fast as we can. And we're working with Catholic charities. They find the housing, they get them enrolled in healthcare, they get the DTA. We teach English, we're gonna help with employment. We've got about half of them here and there's 50% more coming. Uh, Catholic Charities is licensed to resettle 60 in this region. That's not, that's over and above what Jewish Family Services and Accentria Care Alliance are doing further in Hamden County. Um, and it's intense, many of them are pre-literate. So um, Zoom classes really are not an option. We're offer we're, we'll be offering in-person classes. The outpouring of volunteer support is amazing as well as partner support. Um, and both the Catholic Charity Circles of Care and our trained volunteers are supporting. And we're planning a job fair with the Career Center for them in about two weeks. That's great to hear. That's something that we never would have anticipated when we were awarding this uh, grant. So glad you're able to meet that demand and um, wish you all the best in that. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Anybody else have a question? So Lori, I just have a curiosity question. Do you have staff or um, folks in the community that speak the languages that these refugees are familiar with or are speaking? Um, not really. I mean, they speak Dari and Pashto. Um, we have Iranian students and Iranians who speak Farsi can also understand Dari and Pashto. There are some Smith College students and a few other translators. 
The Accentria Care has a language bridge, which is a translation service, which we have a contract with, but it's a good question. Um, translation is appreciated and welcomed. Um, not all of them are not able to speak English. So there's a range. Um, some of the students can speak English. Um, even some of the students who can speak, can, cannot write, can also speak. Um, but yes, translation is, um, is a challenge for sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Anybody else have questions for Lori? Nate or Ben? No, I mean, you know, the, um, you know, every, all the social services for the 20 grant, you know, have submitted their quarterly reports and they're spending down their activity. So, you know, we don't have any concern in terms of their progress or meeting the goals this time. Okay. Thank you so much, Lori. A great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me go. Good luck on your next commitment. Okay. Should we just hop back up to the top of the list? Sure. Okay. Um, so who's representing Amherst Housing Authority Watson Farms? Yeah, Chad uh, Howard is here. Hey, Chad, you can unmute yourself. I think you should be able to speak. Hey, Chad, your screen is still um, still blank, and it you're, uh, talking is permitted. So I don't know if you're if you're trying or. We'll wait another second or two. All right, let's. You want to come back to him? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um... All right, Chad, we're going to put you on hold for now and come back. Uh, Valley CDC. Sure, yeah. Hi, D. You can unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is D. Dice, and I'm representing Valley Community Development. And I have with me Sarah Sargent, who is the brand new, as of I think two weeks now, uh, small business program manager. Okay. So, which is why I'm giving this presentation because uh, she's still getting oriented to all the details. So, uh, Valley Community Development supports small business, and um, certainly we know that not only in Amherst but everywhere, small businesses have been so affected by COVID. And um, what we've seen in Amherst, in particular, is that our one-on-one -on -one um, assistance has been really helpful to businesses. Um, most businesses really, you know, especially retail, um, home-based businesses, several of our businesses in Amherst are home-based businesses, have been so affected um, that, um, you know, they're looking for, you know, the ways that we can help them are, you know, grants and helping them uh, procure grants um, you know, working with them on different accounting systems, we're finding that many small business don't, uh, they don't have any accounting system at all. And so when, um, you know, the different grants, the PPP grant and uh, the COVID related grants came down, one of the first things they needed to do was um, give us a P&L. And many businesses had no idea even how to do that or where to start. The other thing that we noticed it was really large was that um, people lacked the computer skills to fill out forms. And because we've been working with the uh, COVID grants with Amherst, we've had someone um, particular to helping small businesses with that. And he's had to actually go to businesses, take pictures of their tax returns and then um, file them in because people either didn't have the capacity or the knowledge to upload them on their computer. So we feel like our work 
is really important in trying to get businesses up to speed a little bit so that they are ready for the next grant. And also through doing working with the COVID grants, we just see the need as tremendous. Um, Right now, we um, have started again with um, running workshops. We're running every month, a uh, starting a small business workshop. And we also started with um, the uh, marketing. We did a, it's called marketing crash course, but we're in the, um, because of this transition with Sarah taking over, we're in the middle of uh, creating a very robust uh, calendar of workshops. So I think that's about it for a wrap up. I welcome any questions that you have. Can you give us a rough estimate <clears throat> of how many um, small businesses in Amherst have uh, been part of your grant? I would say right now we've done one-on-one -on -one work with between 12 and 15 businesses. And so that certainly doesn't mean 12 to 15 hours. It means that's the number of businesses. You know, some businesses you work with, you know, five to 10 sessions, you know, other people are two to three sessions. And because we really, uh, you know, we don't have a, a blanket program. I mean, it's all customized according to what they need and what stage they're at. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have questions? Um, I just I just wanted to add that because we've been working in Amherst with the COVID grants, um, uh, we it's really been a wonderful process because we have gotten to know a lot of the clients that are low to moderate income. And so, you know, we're helping them with all the technology in order to get to apply for the grant. And when they get the grant, um, then they need help deciding, you know, how to, you know, make sure it's all documented, of course, but also um, how to use that in the best way possible. So it's really um, keyed us into Amherst in general with a low to moderate uh, income population. So it's been a really a nice dovetail between both programs. Thanks. Questions, anybody else? Nate, anything? No, well, thanks, Thank Dee, and uh, welcome, Sarah. I'm sure I'll be working with you. Yep, Thank okay. you. I look forward Thank to it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, do you want to try back for Chad or? Um, did yeah, you Chad emailed me and said he was having trouble. He said he's calling in. So um, I'll try, you can try him again just through the computer and then okay. we can see if, um, if uh, that doesn't work. Chad, I'm going to promote you to panelists. That might help, actually, just to see if that. You should be able to unmute yourself now. If And I'll also allow, there's a one call-in number, allow that person to speak as well. I don't know if that's Chad, but. Hello? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, is this All Chad? Right. Yes, this is Chad. Great. Welcome. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with my uh, computer mic tonight, so I called in, and um, so here I am. You're on. Um, so Amherst, Amherst um, project is a, is a construction project uh, at the Watson Farms development on Main Street in Amherst, um, involving siding replacement of, uh, across the entire development. Um, we, we have not bid the project as we had indicated in our quarterly reports. We are running behind on the, on the project due to uh, you know, construction material inflation from the time that we had submitted our application to now. And so we, we've been jumping through hoops to um, first try to see if there were uh, alternate materials we could use to, um, to kind of get us back within our, our, our initial budget. Uh, which proved to not uh, work out for us. And then the second thing that we did was we just looked for some more money to try to mend the gap between 
um, where we were at and what we had for for funds through CDBG and uh, and our uh, capital HUD grants. Um, our our architect is 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 uh, estimating that our construction is going to be north of three hundred thousand dollars, and we have you know the two hundred thousand um, dollar CDBG grant as well as um, a couple twenty thousand dollars in um, in HUD grants. So we do have federal reserves that uh, in working with our accountant, um, we can use towards this project to, to mend the gap and uh, allow us to bid this project. Um, however, that's just going through an approval process right now um, and with HUD and uh, as long as we get approved for that, which, which we are in being told that we will be able to, we'll be able to uh, use those additional funds to bid this project um, immediately. The, we're, we're thinking that the project needs 120 days for construction. And so we're we're awfully close at this point to, um, you know, get pushing it right up to the end of the you know the 12 month cycle for the CDBG uh, grant. So that is a concern of ours. Um, overrun uh, on the on the 12 months um, funding is not as much of a concern anymore. We do feel pretty confident that we can get the hundred to 150 thousand uh, dollars additional from through our reserves to um, to fund this project. It's, it's a critical need. The project is a critical need and we can't, we don't really have very many options other than to complete the project. Um, so funding is not, not as much of a question anymore, but the, the 12 month cycle certainly is a, is, a, is a question mark in our mind at this point. And w would you remind me what, what's, the, what's the end of the 12 month period? Well, that's just the, that's the, the the grant itself from CDBG is is runs on a uh, from April, I think believe it's April twelfth okay. uh, was the was the initial signing of the contract. So you know there, in the past uh, we we had a, a, a one project several years ago overrun and and we sought out uh, extensions uh, which were granted. But I know that that's not always the case. And Nate probably knows a little bit more about potential extensions. At this point, we're not one hundred percent sure that we even need an extension, but we're very close um, considering uh, needing 120 days for construction and, and not have having bid the project yet. Yeah, I think yeah, that, other, sorry, sorry, I was gonna just jump in. I think the grant might go through June 30th. And so um, I was just trying to look that up. We could always just, you know, have a contract extension. So you don't have to rush it or have people work in really cold weather in the winter, depending on conditions. So. Um, you know, I'll just, I can follow up tomorrow with you, um, knowing that, you know, okay. yeah, I mean, I've told DHCD that there's been some delay. And so we haven't extended our grant with them yet. Um, but so I think we have until um, through June of 22. So I, I can just confirm that. I think that would help tremendously because we are pretty much at a point where we're ready to bid. We, we've, we've really planned this project pr quite thoroughly at this point, considering the uh, the amount of um, changes and, and and alterations we've explored and trying to you know fine tune our budget so we're ready to bid um, we're just waiting for the approval on on the additional funds from uh, through HUD through our reserve um, federal reserves and um, and we could bid it you know get right about now so um, that's our only concern at this point is is the is the, it would be the 12 months. And if that's, if that's less of an issue, then um, we're, we're, you know, we're excited to move forward with this. That's your time. Any questions you. for Chad? Just, just out of curiosity, um, Chad, what, what is the material? What kind of siting are you still planning on? Well, originally we had, we had uh, requested for uh, like a hardy, like a cement board type hardy plank type material because that was what was existing and um dhcd and hud don't uh, uh don't approve vinyl siding at family housing because of durability issues however uh with our budget constraints um we we are uh it, it, we i guess we i guess the the approval of the of using a vinyl siding will be hand in hand with 
the approval of using our federal reserves to, to um, fill the budget. But um, our, we have shifted gears to go with a vinyl siding. I guess I have a question. Do you, I mean, not that you have a crystal ball, but I know everything having to do with construction has, you know, gone up so much since the beginning of COVID, but I'm wondering if you are aware at all, if things are leveling off or starting to come down a little bit price-wise. Yeah, I I haven't seen things come down. You know, we, we bid a lot of projects um, at our state and federal properties, and I haven't seen anything quite start to come down, but it does seem to have leveled off. Um, it was, it was a, uh, really attaining the materials is still a, a, a big problem, but the pr price of materials is, is, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem like things are, are still inflating dr dramatically, at least. Thanks. Anybody else? I think, I think it would be beneficial for us to, to bid the project once, as soon as we get approval, bid it and lock in a price at that point. Ken, have you considered, are you doing, are you going to do a foam backed uh, vinyl just for durability or is it just a, a straight vinyl siding? Yeah, well, we, uh, we're using a, a rigid foam material. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, it wasn't, the, not a, the, the, the siding itself is not, um, is not uh, insulated, but mm -hmm. we are using insulation uh, uh, on, uh, over the sheathing. Other questions? So Nate, you'll follow up tomorrow. Yeah, it looks like we can we can extend it through June, Chad. So that you know that's a, a simple, you know. Yeah. That's, that's pretty that's simple. That's great. Great. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nate, does that cause you a lot of paperwork to extend the grant? No, it's not saying the grant, it's just extending the contract with the housing authority. So that's not, um, you know, DACD likes to have a 12 month implementation window, but they usually gives, they give, usually give us a little bit of cushion. So because there's been some delays, we'll just, you know, it's, they, you know, it's fine with the housing authority. Okay. All right, uh, town of Amherst, Mill Lane. I guess I can speak to that. The. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, the project is extending the multi-use path from East Hadley Road um, across 116. It, you know, there's an existing crosswalk um, and then it's going across the bridge, um, the pedestrian bridge, and then paving a walkway on the north side of Mill Lane. So there's an existing sidewalk and then there's some area where there isn't. So it's creating a new, new and, um, you know, uh, repaving an existing one, um, you know, five to eight feet wide. Uh, and connecting to Groff Park. So that's, um, that is, the designs are almost finalized. It's going to the Conservation Commission. Um, we had, we had um, sought quotes for a surveyor over the summer to do it and a consultant, but everyone has been so busy. Um, it was just, they, their window was a lot longer than um, we, we were hoping. So town staff ended up doing all the wetland work, the surveying and everything. Um, uh, which has been really helpful. So that's, you know, the, the Department of Public Works has undertaken that. And now they're going through permitting with the Conservation Commission because some of the work is in the um, the riverfront and the floodplain. I, I don't think it's in the floodplain, but it's in the riverfront. And so um, I don't think that'll be too too much of a, um, an issue. Uh, the goal is to bid it in January and then, you know, have construction start in the spring and still be done by June 30th. So, you know, we're still working toward the June 30th deadline. Um, you know, price ex escalation is a concern like Chad had mentioned. And so um, there's a few pieces to the project that may need to be eliminated. There was like an overlook um, section where there was like, you know, a little spur of a trail with, with some seating. There was a raised crosswalk that went across Mill Lane to connect to the sidewalk to the south. Um, you know, that this, none of it's really been discussed with public works, but you know, some of it is based on the bidding when that happens, you know, are there things that we may need to eliminate uh, just because, you know, of, again, you're right, this budget was developed a while ago before the prices started increasing so much. And so, um, you know, I, I met with Public Works the other day and they're confident that we still can do it with the budget we have, but maybe some, you know, there may need to be some material substitution or, you know, some changes. 
Can I ask a question? For some reason, I, I don't have my notes from prior meetings up. Is this a carryover from the other Mill Lane project? That so this is a you know this is an independent. Um, I don't know if it's a carryover, you know, it was received in the, we applied in um, 2020. And so it's only, you know, there's, you know, we, we had allocated 300,000 from the 20 grant for this project. So it's only this one, you know, only the 20 grant, the 19 and 18 grant paid for East Hadley Road. And so it's not really, I mean, it's not a carryover. It's just, you know, kind of the a continuation of that project, but the funding isn't, hasn't been carried over. Okay. I have to say, I see, a lot of, I see a lot of use of that East Hadley Road, um, you know, multi use path. So it'd be great to have that extended. Yeah. Yeah, we agree. It's disappointing it's taken so long. But, um, you know, like I said, it, it was hard with COVID. And then coming out of COVID, it's been, you know, still a challenge finding consultants and, you know, outside help. I do have to say I was at Groff Park last week with some small friends and I was blown away by how great the project is and how many people were there. It's really an amazing place. So to have this multi-use you know, path in place so folks can walk from all those housing complexes would be great. I mean, I mean, they can walk now, but walk confidently and safely. Right, no, I agreed. Yeah, I was there a lot this spring uh, just, just uh, with my family too. And I was amazed at how busy it was. It's really nice. Thank you. Any other questions for Nate on Millane? I didn't even set the timer. <laughs> you came in under time. All right. Um, Amherst Community Connections. All right. Let's see. Yep. Hi. Good evening, everyone. This is Waylon Greeny. How are you all? Thank you so much for having us here tonight. And uh, I'd like to talk about money. Uh, we are getting a lot of money for the people we work with. And the money comes in the form of the benefits. So this particular season started March when we started our CDBG uh, funding for the cycle. We focus on how to get more public benefits to the hands of the people. So therefore, they can save the cold cash to pay the rent. So this strategy has worked. So I want to tell you about the benefits that we are able to uh, obtain for them. As you know, that the child tax credit is $2,000 to $2,500 per child, depending on the age. So that's a big uh, federal grant, federal program that we are working hard to get many families to be eligible for. So if a family that we work with has three children, they are getting about $6,000 to $7,000. And that's a lot of money they can use to pay for the rent. And the other thing that we help families obtain SNAP benefits. Because of the pandemic, the SNAP has become very generous and they waive a lot of documentation requirements that we know how to do. So therefore a family used to be getting about 200 or $300 of SNAP benefits. Right now we are able to get them almost double the amount. And the third thing that I want to brag about is our emergency broadband benefits application program. Because of the COVID-19, the federal government approved so much funding for many benefits and EBB, emergency broadband benefits, it's something families used to be hard pressed to get internet connection because as you might know, it costs upward of $60 for the very basic service. But thanks to the EBB benefit, we are able to secure for many families. So they are paying about $10 a month instead of the $60. So therefore the savings is $50 we're talking about. And the next thing that I want to talk to you about is that we are very happy. The raft program is in full swing thanks to the CHAPA grant that we just received yesterday. Uh, we will be putting out even more workers on the street to get families and individuals eligible to apply for raft. But so far, since March uh, this year, up until now, 
we have about a hundred plus thousand dollars we are able to secure for our participants, families, and individuals. And the average receive about $3,000 either for the rent that they anticipate they might be behind due to loss of seasonal work or money that they owe to their landlord. So we are able to secure both money to pay forward to the landlord because of anticipation of drop in income and money to pay the back rent. So thanks to CHAPA's grant that we have just received, notified yesterday that we will be hiring our community members. And primarily these are community members, they speak the following languages, Khmer, Spanish, Creole. These are the populations in the town of Amherst have the need for raft financial assistance to pay rent or pay utility arrears. So we are training our community outreach workers. And today we had our first gathering, talk to four mothers. They came with their children and we have started the training, asking them to reach out to their own language community and to help them interpret, educate them about the benefits that they could receive that you do not have to be behind on rent. You do not have to have received the 30 day notice to quit. No, you want to get the money and prevent homelessness, prevent from going to housing court. So these are the things that we have been focusing on. So money is the key word, but preventing homelessness by stretching the public benefits dollars they can receive, that's the strategy in order to preserve the cash it must have to pay the landlord. And the final point I want to share with you is that we also have received the DPH, Department of Public Health, a state program called Low Threshold Housing. So we have been provided with the grant to house 10 units, 10 people or 10 units for people who suffer from substance use disorders and or uh, mental health diagnoses. So this is a statewide program and we are one of the seven agencies chosen in the statewide competition. So we are able to provide not only the housing, but a very decent caseworker ratio, one to 10, one caseworker for 10 residents. So this is a very exciting program. We are engaging uh, the community and we have collaborators, uh, our local shelter, or the uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, or the uh, BHN, Behavior Health Network. They have reached out to us. We are talking about collaboration using the bed, the units to house patients who are about to be discharged, but they are homeless. And they also suffer from the substance use disorder and or a mental health disorder. So these are all wonderful programs that we have been doing, but we would not be able to do any of these if it weren't because of our dedicated interns, caseworkers. So our ratio is also very good. Every intern has 10 cases that they are handling and all together we have 10 caseworkers. So everyone is kept very busy, but we also have an outreach worker who does outreach talking to about 300 also of households. I Wheeling, sure. Wheeling, you've got about 20 seconds left. Okay, that's about the time I need. So therefore, <laughs> everybody is working hard and the goal is to prevent homelessness in the community. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question. You mentioned something, it's RAFT, R-A-F-T? Correct. Can you explain what, the, what it stands for, please? Okay, it stands for uh, residential assistance for family in transition. Thank you. And it's meant to be for families who either be high on rent or be high on utility, or they need money to move into their apartments and need to pay for first month, last month and security. So the raft is run by wayfinders in our region and we have great collaboration with the RAFT uh, 
regional office wayfinders. So therefore, we are relying on them to process applicants from our agency ASAP. And that has been very productive in the relationship. Great, thank you. Questions for Wei Lang? Yes, Wei Lang, one question. Um, I know that kind of around the country, people have been talking about upticks in evictions in our region. Have you felt that there has been an uptick or have we been able to avoid that um, concern recently? I want to say that we have been very blessed in this region. We are able to prevent a lot of homelessness thanks to the infusion of raft money. And also there is a regulation in the book right now. Massachusetts is one of the three states that if you have applied for raft, then the judge cannot accept an eviction from the landlord. So by giving our participants a confirmation letter from us stating this applicant has applied for raft and use that letter to give to the landlord. So the landlord don't even bother to go to housing court to file for eviction because the money will come. You just have to wait. So therefore that has prevented a lot of homelessness or eviction notification. Thank you. Any other questions for Wei Ling? Nate, Ben, committee? No? Okay, Wei Ling, thank you very much for such a detailed okay. report. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Big brothers, big sisters. You know, they, they're, um, you know, Jesse left as their executive director, and I'm not sure there's anyone here right now to represent them. Jesse Cooley left? She did. Was that recent? Well, it was pretty recent, I think. I forget um, when, I, when, she, when I received that email. Um, I didn't know. Yeah, I was surprised. Someone, had, someone said, oh, did you hear about it? And I was like, no. And then sure enough, a week later, um, <laughs> um, she sent me an email, but I was, uh, I didn't know that was happening. Wow. I figured she would have let, I'm surprised she didn't let you know personally. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it was, um, well, I mean, we, she was, yeah, I mean, I guess it was um, in September um, that she was, you know, she let us know. And I think she was, you know, sometime in October or something um, that she would be leaving. Is there anybody, is the other, isn't there another Jesse? Uh, Jess Daly, she also left. Oh my God. So yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm not, maybe they weren't, if they were contacted, no one, um, no one is here. No one, okay. So do you end up reaching out to them to get a status report? Yeah, they submit quarterly reports and I'm surprised, I thought if we send it to Jess, Jesse by accident or Jess, the email would have uh, been forwarded, but um, yeah, because they're still, I mean, they still, they submitted their quarterly report and then, you know, we still have invoices coming from them. Um, so. so who's at the helm? Yeah, I'm, right now, well, Tom had been stepping in um, and Miranda McGuire uh, were both kind of filling in. Um, um, so Tom and are and they board know. members? Who, who are those people? Oh, Tom, Tom and Miranda, they were, their staff of uh, Big Brother Big Sister, so one was a, a caseworker supervisor. I think Miranda was the same one. So they were, they had both been, um, you know, involved in working with the um, mentors and then also supervising and you know doing uh, things on their, um, you know, independently and being a manager of her program. So they were both kind of filling in together. Oh, what a huge I just wow. googled it. I just googled it now, and apparently um, October twentieth. In the Gazette, it said that Susan Nicastro has been named the program director for BBBS of Hampshire County, um, succeeding Jesse Cooley. Mm. Okay. I guess that brings us to the Amherst Survival Center. Mm -hmm. All right, Lev, you can um, unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Perfect. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, really appreciate uh, being able to check in with the committee about our progress on CDBG goals so far. It has certainly been an incredibly uh, busy and important six months or so. Um, in Since the um, start of this April contract, uh, the Amherst Survival Center has continued our expanded uh, COVID pantry programming that has included increased allocations of food, grocery delivery, delivery curbside pickup, and expanded outreach. And in September, we also reopened our on-site pantry to in-person full choice shopping, which has just been amazing. Um, for anyone that's familiar with the center's layout, we're now using the space that previously was dedicated to fresh food distribution. And we also um, knocked out the walls of a storage closet in uh, the food pantry proper and has that has I don't know, tripled or quadrupled the actual shopper space for the food pantry, which has enabled people to use much larger carts to accommodate the much larger allocations of groceries and to also have people spaced out to be able to shop more safely. And that has just been so delightful. Talk about just the simple pleasures of being able to pick out um, all of your own food. People have just been so happy, whether it's getting to select like specific snacks that a picky kid likes or planning for specific meals. Um, people have just been really excited for that. Um, and certainly that is always our philosophy that of course people should be able to pick the food that works the best for them, them and their families and what they will actually eat. And so we're really thrilled to have that. Um, but it's also been really interesting. We were actually anticipating a larger shift from people who are on delivery uh, back towards the in-person shop. And we have certainly seen some drop off. There have some people been some people who had been getting delivery or had been getting curbside who are now coming on site and shopping for themselves. But it's been fewer people that have made that shift um, than we had anticipated. And that's really because what we keep hearing is that the um, speed and not having to wait in line and not having to get out of your car if you have kids in the car or rushing home from work of curbside or just the convenience of delivery has made such an enormous difference for people. Um, I've heard repeatedly that folks have said, oh, I used to only make it every couple of months because that would be when my work schedule would work. But now I know that I have reliable access to food every month that's you know this large grocery delivery that's coming every month so that has really just solidified our commitment to maintaining these expanded programs um, because the the access that they're providing is huge um so our goal for this 12 month contract period was to provide free monthly groceries for 1500 to 2000 low-income amherst residents and to date, we have provided more than 250,000 meals worth of groceries to 1,529 Amherst residents. And that includes 424 kids and 234 seniors. Um, and I was really, we, uh, over the summer, I guess, and in, in into September, we completed a pretty extensive survey of food pantry shoppers and um, lots of really important feedback and lessons learned and information about things that people want more of and just really great learning opportunities for us. But um, it was also really important to see that 96% of our food pantry shoppers said that due to the Amherst Survival Center food, pot, food pantry, that they were more food secure and 95% shared that this food enabled them to prepare healthy meals at home. And 99% of the survey respondents said that they would recommend the Amherst Survival Center to a friend. And that to me just, I think that might be the most uh, important metric almost to me <laughs> in the whole survey, because I feel like what that gets at is people feeling like a space or a service is meeting their needs, that they are being treated well, that the food that they're getting is high quality. We also asked about all those things and there were high statistics there as well, but it talks about an overall of, if you think that this is sufficient enough that you're gonna be willing to say, hey, this is a place that I go and access food and it's really great. Why don't you come with me? Or why don't you go too? 
Um, a couple of other uh, important pieces. Oh, I think I skipped over when I was sharing the numbers of those 1,529 Amherst residents that we've served so far this year, um, 794 have received grocery delivery. So um, we've really um, more or about half of those, we're just over half of those Amherst residents that are being served are in fact being served by delivery um, and continues to be a really significant need. One of the other pieces that we formalized uh, just within the last couple of months um, was maintaining our expanded Kids Boost program. So this was a program that's been in place in the food pantry for several years, providing additional groceries for families with children during the months when there were school vacations to make up for the loss of school provided meals. And um, so when COVID hit, we expanded that because students weren't out of school for a week. They were out of school all month, every month. And we made that across the board. Um, but we got such positive feedback about that. And we're continuing to hear again through our survey and also through anecdotal evidence that it really was families with kids who were most likely to tell us that they needed more food. Um, so we've just institutionalized that at this point and have that expanded kids boost it's all month, every month for every family with children ages zero to 18. Um, so really just expanding that access and making sure that families have good, high quality, healthy food, um, as well as also kid-friendly items, things that older kids and teens can prepare for themselves, uh, those kinds of things. Um, we are still working on our plan to um, increase to the full two weeks of food um, our goal for this year's CDBG was to maintain the recently increased allocation of eight to 10 days worth of food. And that is up to we're solidly at 10 or more days per household. Um, some many household sizes are actually already getting the full two weeks and we're working to get that up for everybody um, and figuring out those plans. So- but 20 seconds left. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so I think the last piece that I'll just say is around our ongoing efforts to increase the sourcing and availability of culturally appropriate foods. Um, and this has been something we've been really focused on with our local Latinx community, it's something we're working on now with our local Chinese and Chinese American communities, and the our recent welcoming of many Afghan evacuees and refugees to our local community has really prioritized that, both in terms of language access, um, as well as halal food, halal meats, other specific items, and having that available Available. So that's another key priority for us at this time. Thank you, Lev. Wow, so much going on. Questions? I had a question. So Lev, you mentioned that you've increased the, the child, the, the food for children and they're, they're in school. So when they're out of school, will you increase it further? That's a great question. Um, at this point, we have just instituted that families with kids, and it's really, I mean, we do include additional kids specific items, um, but especially for anyone shopping on site with choice, it's just additional points for produce and additional points for protein and additional milk and additional. So it's just extra food for those families with children. Um, so I think that the bigger shift for us is really just recognizing that, um, those were food pantry shoppers that were identifying that they need more food and kind of supporting families with accessing that on a more consistent basis. Um, whether or not their kids are specific are also eating school provided meals. Um, but you raise a really good question. Um, I'd hope that the additional food that we're providing now will help to cover that in terms of um, months with like a week long school vacation. Um, but I think as we look ahead to next summer, uh, that is a very likely place where uh, you raise a really good point in terms of increasing further then and we'd certainly be open to that. I have a question. So you're letting folks in now to shop and is, um, are you, I'm sure you're limiting the number of people that can come in at a time and not line up like in the past. So are you managing with your existing hours to serve everybody because you can only let X number of people in at a time? 
Another excellent question. So what we're seeing is um, your, your question alludes to several things which have been accurate. So yes, we have still have extensive COVID safety protocols in place. Um, everyone is masked. People are actually still waiting outside. So they're just coming in when they're ready to shop. And as I mentioned, the pantry is set up very differently and with a much larger space. So we're able to provide adequate distancing so that folks are actually both have, I think, kind of a less crowded shopping experience and also have the space that they need to navigate safely um, in terms of proximity and COVID. Um, in terms of the issue of hours, the interesting piece that's happened is while we are serving more people, we continue to serve so many people through delivery and curbsides that we're actually serving about half as many people as we used to on site in the choice pantry. It's a little bit more than that, but I don't know, maybe 60%. I'd have to run the numbers to be exact. Um, and so that has been, that's an important factor. And then the other piece is that we have also added, um, I'm gonna be, cautious for any members of the public who are listening. We have, an, we have a clear end time that is similar to what our end time was previously, but we now, as long as people are registered by then, we then have a buffer for them to finish their shop. So essentially there is more time that allows that shopping, um, whereas that used to all be rolled into the open hours, um, if that makes sense the way that I'm explaining it. Um, it has been a challenge in November and particular. Um, people get um, more food because of Thanksgiving. Um, and we also, November is always our busiest month in the food pantry. So we've been running into some challenges there. So we actually, we just extended that buffer a little bit and are working on shifting some staff hours. And I think um, we'll see if more people continue to come on site, we may need to expand our hours and our exploring options, options for that. So um, I think it's really important that people have the time to carefully select the, the food that they're getting. I think the limiting factor or what's slowing people down is less about the number of people in the building and it's actually more that they're leaving with twice as much food as what they used to get at the, at the pantry. And so that takes more time <laughs> to pick out, um, particularly the produce, like they're leaving with so much more produce. It's like, and we have really good stuff. And so they're just, it takes time to decide what you want, which is what everyone should have is the opportunity to pick what they want. Um, so I think that's something that we're working on operationally is to make sure that that's feasible. Great, thanks. Any anybody else have questions? Yes, love. Um, we hear a lot about food price inflation and uh, supply chain disruptions. I know you're very creative in how you source uh, food uh, for the pantry, but <clears throat> are you finding any disruptions or you know constraints in supply? Uh, such a great question. Well. The first thing that I'll articulate is that the food price inflations are having a really dramatic impact on who needs to access the food pantry and also the amount of food that a person's SNAP benefits or other benefits can buy them at the store and thus the, the issue of more food. So I think the recent you know, over the last several months, increases there have really upped the ante for us in terms of figuring out how to increase the amount of food that people can come and increase the frequency with which people can come, et cetera, um, which we very much want to do. It's a matter of uh, the operational capacity to source that additional food and to have us open enough, et cetera, but it's something that we're working really hard on. Um, in terms of our own sourcing constraints, um, I'll just give a shout out and an enormous thank you to the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. They have been absolutely unbelievable over the last 18 plus months, however long we've been in this mess, um, in terms of their work, uh, both just very directly and up operationally in terms of getting food and increasing the amounts that we're able to get from them, but also their work and partnership with member agencies in terms of advocacy to the state and the federal government around MEFAP and USDA foods. So we so far um, have not experienced severe supply chain disruptions in terms of what we're able to access. 
I think that sometimes we get more of something and you don't get something else for a while, but in terms of overall quantities, we've been able to do that. And we've also have been hearing and continue to hear that it's like, well, oh, we don't know when there's gonna be this change with the USDA. Like there keep being these question marks that are like a month down the line. Um, and so have uh, lots of plan Bs and Cs and Ds for various ways that we may be able to address um, the shifts in that state and federal policy in terms of that food, uh, because that will have an, utterly enormous impact on us in any big shifts there. I mean, we, um, I should know these numbers off the top of my head, but I would say, I don't know, probably spend 95% of our food budget on 15% of our food or something like right? that. Like it's very specific items. It's that we purchase fresh milk because that's something that over and over again, we heard from families that they didn't want shelf staple milk. Um, and that's all we can get from the food bank or we um, purchase fresh produce to make sure we have produce that's available year round, that's good quality, or we um, purchase specifically culturally appropriate items to make sure that we have core staples that, um, appeal to and meet the needs of our diverse community. So I think those are the pieces, whereas, you know, we're never buying their core staples that we can always get donated and that's a real bulk of it. Um, so real shifts in what was available through those systems um, will definitely have a have a big impact on us. But so far we've kind of been able to mitigate the, the ups and downs there. I have a question, Led, you mentioned before something about um... I think in response to the question about um, having people come in more and, and needing more hours that you would, would maybe need to staff up. When you say that, is that about volunteers or is that actually increasing staff time and paid staff time? It would have to be both. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'll mention uh, that may be of interest to some members of the committee, it's not specifically related to the food pantry, but we also in September, at the same time that we opened the food pantry for in-person shopping, we also opened the space that was form formerly and will again be our community store um, to be a warming center specifically for individuals experiencing homelessness. And we've and we've since expanded those hours um, to try to accommodate the majority of the time that the Craig's Doors uh, congregate shelter at the church is closed so that people have a place when that closes in the morning to be able to come to us. And so um, that's not something that we've ever had before. And it was something actually that before COVID, I was in conversation with Craig's Doors and trying to figure out if there was a better way for us to collaborate and provide that. So that feels like a really important accomplishment to have longer hours of access. And that includes both the warm space to be inside. We have computer access and phone and charging stations, but it also, it means that we have now have extended hours for access to the shower and laundries and lockers. Um, and that's been very important now and will be really, really important in February. Um, so, but I, I do feel confident. Um, I think we've learned a lot over the last year plus, I feel confident with our COVID protocols, et cetera, that we're able to do that in a manner that's um, still frankly pretty conservative safety wise and um, and will enable those operations to, to keep up. But that and potential increases in um, pantry hours definitely would require both uh, increased staffing and volunteer time. It's not one or the other. Questions, questions anybody else? I have another, another question. Um, so I follow you on social media and I get all your communications and I know you've had a fair amount of staff turnover that Kara left and you've had food pantry managers come and go and has that um, impacted the efficiency in the way you work and has it caused you any setbacks? Cause there has been, um, it's been during a difficult time. Yeah, no, I appreciate you asking that. Um, well, Carol leaving was a major challenge. She had been with the organization for 14 years um, and really was just ready for a new chapter in her, her career, actually doing things other than, other than finance. So um, I feel uh, incredibly appreciative of her, of 
staying um, basically through the heart of COVID as she decided to do, because that was a, a really important contribution. So um, on the fiscal end of things, um, I personally, in terms of my own workload, and incredibly, incredibly, incredibly relieved that we uh, just hired a new director of finance and admin, um, who I think is fabulous, uh, Phil gilfeather -Gerton. Um, and, um, we were actually really, it was fabulous. Kara agreed to stay on in a very temporary interim capacity, just doing our bookkeeping. So between her and an outsourced nonprofit accounting firm, I think we were well covered with that. Um, I just learned, uh, more than I had ever known previously about the ins and outs of our audit process and some other things over, um, over the last several months. Um, and in terms of our program staff, it's interesting. We had we had some particularly significant turnover right at the start of COVID. We had several staff retirements, folks who, and I think frankly, retirements that were absolutely hastened by the pandemic and not wanting to be in person at a place like the Amer, you know, at a place serving the public at the Amherst Survival Center. Um, and then in a dramatic expansion of our staff. So we have continued to have, you know, there has been some turnover, but it has not been at a level that uh, brings significant concern to, to me or the board ongoing um, in terms of just some amount of that, particularly among we had so many new staff who started at the same time, there's kind of just a, a reality that some people are gonna choose to move on to other, other pieces. So really um, important learning lessons there in terms of, and not all easy ones in terms of just really, you know, we grew really, really, really fast. Um, we doubled our operations in a couple of months and, doubled our staff in less than a year. And with that came some growing pains and some challenges and some mistakes that I made, <laughs> some things that, you know, we had to recalibrate in terms of, uh, you know, getting the right people doing, you know, each in the right places. But um, I, I really can't speak highly enough about the, the team that we have. It's been incredible to watch folks really grow into their roles and just, uh, take fully take hold of the the vision for the center and kind of what we can be and our hope for what we're providing for folks who are coming and um i think we're kind of just actually feel like we're 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 hitting a stride with folks who have um now now been here for around a year or just over a year and um and really seeing that happen so um it has certainly uh yes they're I don't want to, you know, minimize the importance of those transitions. They've been really significant and some of them challenging and also um, feel really confident in, in our team. Thanks. Anybody else have questions? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Lev. Thank you for the good work that you do. And thanks to everybody for all the good work that they do. Um, and we're on to family outreach. Laura? Uh, Francine is here. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Laura had a, another commitment, so she asked me to report this evening to the committee. Um, I'm the program manager for Family Outreach of Amherst. Um, I also may, uh, run and provide direct service to our um, community housing support program, which is funded by the CDBG grant. And the main goals of our program are advocacy with landlords, assistance with rental arrears, and ongoing support for tenants who are in danger of losing their housing in Amherst. In the first quarter, um, we served 96 beneficiaries. And in the second quarter, we served 105 beneficiaries. beneficiaries. So it's been pretty consistent. Um, in those quarters, we definitely applied for RAF for many, many people. It was a total of 57 beneficiaries. Um, totaling in both quarters to apply for RAFT, which is the Residential Aid for Families in Transition, to pay some significantly high rental arrears. We're talking, you know, eight to nine months of rents that were at like $1,300. Um, you know, one of the persons I applied for, you know, owed a total of like $24,000 in rent. 
Um, so luckily, Raft was awarded, you know, billions of dollars. So they upped, usually Raft would, pre-pandemic would only cover like $4,000 max. Now they're covering up to the 20 and, and even more um, if the family's eligible. That particular family, they did pay off her rental arrears. And then they also gave her a three-month stipend of full contract rent. Um, to help her get back on her feet because they, you know, they, they're being realistic where, yes, we're going to pay this money, but if she's not back to work full time, she's not going to be able to sustain the rent. So it's, it's, it's really beautiful that they've been able to expand what they're helping. They're really remarkable. I mean, we would have so many homeless families without that program. Um, so as far as we also provide court advocacy, and since the pan, since the moratorium, I should say, ended, um, there has been a little bit of an uptick of folks getting court summonses. Um, but the courts, luckily, the Massachusetts courts are in favor of tenants and realize what the pandemic has created for the housing crisis. And so what happens, I've been able to attend within these two quarters, seven court Zooms with families. And what happens in those hearings is a continuance is automatically granted for three months, allowing that family to apply for rental arrears for raft. Um, then they will come back in three months to revisit how it's going. Did they apply? Did they get all their verifications in and so forth? Um, and then again, it's gonna be continued for another three months. So it's in, working in the favor of the tenant because now we're at six months. Um, but meanwhile, yes, there has to be a plan in place for them to be paying what they can towards their actual rent. Um, so then they realize, the court realizes Raft also, they're overwhelmed and they are paying a lot of, they cover Hamden and Hampshire County. So, you know, they know the process is long. It takes, it could take six months or more before a landlord will see any money. Um, but the courts are working with the tenants and not allowing the landlord to evict. They have to wait. If, if that's part of the agreement, if they're getting wrapped, you must wait and you cannot evict them. Um, so that's that's definitely working in the favor of our tenants. Um, also, another challenge that I've been seeing a, a large uptick on are families that are getting Section 8 vouchers. Um, I'm working right now with a woman who recently got a Section 8 voucher through Cooley Dickinson, a program at Cooley Dickinson, and she was behind in rent. So we applied for raft. She's been approved, um, but you only have 90 days to use this voucher and she wanted to stay in Amherst. So we cannot find uh, a three bedroom in the payment standard for the voucher in Amherst. The housing stock just is not there. Affordable housing to match up with the payment standard just doesn't exist in unfortunately. And not only in Amherst, it's in the surrounding towns all over the state, really, it's an issue. Um, but luckily I did find her a three bedroom that matched the payment standard and it was actually with her current landlord. Um, it was right over the Amherst line. So it's very close you know, to Amherst. It would be Belchertown though. But the problem now is her landlord refuses to let her transfer to this unit until he gets the raft money. And that could take six months. And then she's gonna lose this voucher. She doesn't put it into play. And we're not going to find another three bedroom in this area for her to utilize that voucher. So, um, you know, we're looking, I'm trying to get, you know, see if there's a loophole in her lease, um, trying to see, you know, if we can just get, an, get people support. She's involved with like churches and there's other people and get Mindy Dom involved and maybe reach out to the landlord to say, you know, cut this woman a break. You're going to get the money. You're always going to get the money once we transfer her to this three bedroom because the portion of the rent will be paid by the voucher program. So it's like a win win for him. But again, I understand, you know, the landlords are struggling with, you know, their their businesses as well. So we have to be realistic on that. But, you know, just now the challenge is trying to mediate with this landlord to see if he'll, you know, cut this woman a break and and transfer her and um then she'd be able to sustain the rent. Because if she stays in the unit she's in, she can't return to work right now because she has a three-year-old and no childcare. So he's not gonna get his rent if he keeps her in this unit either. 
you know, so that that's just my current case that I'm, you know, it's the, the things we're seeing with our tenants are becoming more complicated than normal, I guess, post pan, you know, post pandemic, and I guess post moratorium ending, um, you know, the, the cases are just becoming a bit more complicated. They're not just so simple as just plain rental arrears either. Um, Francine, I just have to cut, give you like a, a 20 minute, 20 second warning. Sure, no problem. Um, so I guess I wanted to end on another, I know, you know, everything's kind of the negative. So I just wanted to share a quick little positive story of a family I've been working with who throughout the pandemic, you know, had her struggles, was, you know, had on, was on unemployment and um, out of work, she returned to work. But throughout the pandemic, I provided her resources um, on home ownership because she's paying like $1,600 for a two bed, three bedroom apartment in Amherst. Um, so she actually followed through. We worked really closely together and she was able to complete a first time home buyer program. And she has closed on a house. Um, actually on Monday was the closing and she will be paying less than she was paying in rent for a home. It is not in Amherst is the, you know, the downside. Um, it's in Holyoke, but she'll still be in Amherst or, you know, she works at Amherst College. So she'll still be, you know, part here in town. But, you know, that's that's a win win for her as well. I mean, she's going to be paying mortgage at sixteen hundred, fifteen hundred less than she was paying in rent. So I'm really happy for her. And, you know, she really followed through and she was one that saved those stimulus checks <laughs> for uh, for a down payment on the house. She played, you know, she played her cards right. So she's able now to to be successful. I'm really proud of her. So that's just, I wanted to end on a positive and not all of the negative of, you know, housing crisis in Massachusetts. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for leaving us with uh, an upbeat story. Um, anybody have questions for Francine? Okay. I think this concludes the review of the ongoing activities from fiscal year 2020 and brings us on to the item number two, comments on the outcome, effectiveness, and ways to improve the CDBG process. Can I lead off with Nate and Ben from your perspective? I mean, you're the ones that have to write the, you know, take everything, write it, get it out in time. And how has the timeline worked for you? Uh, good. You know, there's five members in attendance, so we haven't we've lost a few members in uh, from the audience who presented and maybe left. Um, you know, DHCD asked that we have this topic. I don't want to say it's perfunctory. Um, I think there's always ways to um, change the you know change the process or improve. I think you know every year we discuss whether or not um, you know um, currently funded activities or ones that receive funding in consecutive years may not get funding or reduce funding or do we weight priorities differently. Um, so I think you know that's some of it how that could be part of the discussion in terms of the outreach. Um, you know, I feel like we do run a pretty good program. Um, you know, one year we did a survey to get community input in terms of helping develop priorities. So I think you know along those lines we could consider what are other outreach methods in terms of trying to engage. You know, we have Engage Amherst now, so are there some other platforms we could use to try to um, seek public input during the community priority? You know phase of, of the process. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, um, I will say that the organizations we fund, um, you know, do implement their programs well. So we don't have an issue with uh, necessarily with, you know, extensions or running into problems. You know, sometimes a town project may go longer, you know, or, or you know, one may go longer, but I feel like we, you know, I think the committee does a good job through the proposal review process of selecting activities that are capable of implementing their program. And so there's a block grant round table. It was just kind of local communities in Western Mass and it's grown to be more communities that receive um, block grant money. And so at a recent meeting the other week, some communities were saying that they still are trying to finish up their 18 and 19 grants, which are you know years old. And so, you know, we've been in that position where we've had project, you know, grants that have been extended for the full three years. And we haven't lately. And I think that's, you know, a credit to the review of the committee and the process we have to select the activity. So in terms of, you know, implementation, I feel like we do a pretty good job. I think some of what DACD could be asking is, you know, do we, you know, are there ways we could improve our public kind of process at the beginning or, you know, if we think so, I mean, I don't, you know, it's more like a, you know, it's a local decision, 
you know, DHCD hasn't, hasn't said that we need to, they just ask that communities do this kind of self-reflection throughout the year. I think what's always comes up when we have these, the meetings with the deliberating over the proposals is, I don't like to use the word fairness, but you know, is it equitable for organizations to get funded multiple years in a row even though they may be having the greatest impact in the community. Um, and should we give an organization a year off so we could fund so does the underdog, so to speak, who doesn't necessarily get the weight when we're in the scoring process. So it's a conundrum that we face every year. So I don't know if this is a good time, probably a good time to discuss it. Yeah, or at least, you know, consider that when we meet again in, in March, you know, that that's, you know, that could be a topic of discussion or, you know, we can meet again in January. It doesn't have to be, you know, we could set, we could set another meeting date too to discuss a few of these. Um, yeah, I see D, D raised her hand. Sure, D, you can unmute yourself. Great, thank you. I um, think that you guys do a great job and that I just wanted to tell you, this is the first year that Valley Community Development has um, been awarded um, money for the micro program. And I'm, you know, I think you guys do a great job in dividing up the money. And even though, you know, our numbers certainly pale compared to the number of, you know, meals given out. And, um, you know, I uh, appreciate that in that, you know, helping small businesses help the community in general and help with hiring. And so our reach is wider than the existing numbers. Um, and, you know, from a reporting perspective, I mean, Nate, you've been great as far as uh, reminding us when the reports are due and that they're not so cumbersome and hard that it really, you know, detracts from our mission and what we do. So I just wanted to thank you. And um, from my perspective, you guys are doing a great job. And uh, Valley's really appreciative because we are a new person in, um, you know, a, a new uh, recipient. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. Sure. Yeah, I have um, something and I apologize for this weird light. I tried to move, there are a lot of people in the other room and I can't find a place where I'm not. We can still see you and hear you, just a little fuzzy. <laughs> right. You're a little fuzzy, um, usually, but we still hear you clearly. Okay, fuzzy with like a beam of light in front of my face. Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, so, I wonder if, and I don't have it fully formed, but if there's a way to think about ranking, doing our ranking in categories rather than everybody against everybody, and also possibly setting aside some money, you know, whether it's a specific amount or just knowing that one of the grants we give would go to a brand new organization. I think what I really appreciated about like the mobile market is that it saw a need in town and it created this program that met this need. And of course it's not as well established as anyone else because it's just here, right? So they can't be sort of as impressive maybe or, or and we don't have a sense of it being necessary for the community in the same way that maybe we think about like a survival center or family outreach. But I think it's really important that we support organizations that are filling gaps that they're identifying and that are, that are clearly there. And it may not happen every year, but I, I just think that that's, and maybe we just make that be a, another priority that we look at of, of, you know, a new gap filling or something, I don't know. But I think um, it's important that we encourage new organizations to come in and to meet needs that maybe didn't exist or just weren't, hadn't been identified yet. Thanks, and when you say, um ranked by categories. So we would separate out what the organizations do and would they each of them, would each category have similar um, scoring mechanisms or would they be scored yeah, I guess, I mean, I, again, you know, I haven't thought it all the way through, but I, I think the idea that we're sort of ranking the survival center at, that we're just looking at that final number, right? And so, rather than saying, okay, these are the programs that help these, this 
you know, that, that fill um, this particular need. These are the programs that fill this particular need and rank those amongst each other. I think the, the scoring would probably still be the same. Um, it's just that we're not comparing the survival center to the center for new Americans because that's really an apples and oranges comparison. So instead it's all the programs that do work with immigrants, all the programs that do work with, and I know there's crossover for all of them, but programs that focus on food, you know, whatever, however we decided to, to identify those as, as categories. And maybe- My thought is we, yeah, we set community priorities, right? So we have like right, food so and nutrition. Be, right. Um, you know, certain, you know, so there's like seven, you know, youth mentoring. And so my thought is if the committee want to do that, maybe we weight those, those um, categories so that then, um, you know, there's one way to do it. I think the category thing, Becky, you're saying could be difficult because what if you have seven different categories of proposals, we can only fund five. And so typically when we would, you know, when the town does this, we, it's a comparative criteria um, across the board of any proposal that's submitted, not breaking them down by specific categories and then comparing just like say three food and nutrition proposals or two, you know, um, you know, say like education, adult education programs, it's usually a, a comparison between all the proposals submitted is the way that, you know, would right. That's how we did it last time. And I guess I'm just thinking about how to think about things a little bit differently, I guess. And I don't, you know, it would maybe result in the same or end up with the same result. I'm not sure, but just, it felt like it was a little bit, there was this sense of sort of trying to figure out what's more important somebody being homeless, somebody being hungry, somebody needing a job. And there's just no way to do that. And maybe, um, I mean, it's maybe it's just an impossible task, but maybe it would be easier to talk about the, the organizations in, in their priority group rather than comparing two that do such drastically different work. Well, I kind of wish there was um, some hard statistics, um, some sort of objective analysis of what the need of the community was. Is not not to discount what the feedback was from the community, but just to give sort of a more, even if it's not 100% accurate, some sense of what the the hard you know where does the rubber meet the road, you know, and um, that's something I I sort of missed as far as. Um, trying to come in and figure out what, you know, my function here was. Um, but it, it is an interesting idea. I like the idea um, that Becky, I think, brought up about maybe we have one category, you know, one thing where you just say this has to be new, a new person. Well, like every five years you can reapply for it, but that's, it has to be somebody and it gives people a chance to, to make an impact and come in and, and do something new that, you know, maybe shakes things up a little. I don't know. But anyway, that's. Yeah, I mean, I will say that Ben and I met with um, the mobile market, for example, after their proposal. And I think that, you know, sometimes it's difficult to fund an agency uh, when they first apply because they may, you know, they may not actually be ready to receive block grant money just in terms of what, you know, the block grant program has some strict regulations. And so I think, you know, what we do is encourage an applicant to apply again and working with the mobile market. I think that, you know, there are some questions that we asked that staff, we, and I think, Gail, yeah, you were there, right? We clarified, and they said that some of their other, um, they applied to other programs that had similar questions. And so, you know, ironically, that program, um, you know, they're mentioning, you know, it's food, but it's also a jobs program, and it didn't fit neatly into a block grant category, unfortunately, for them. Um, and some of it is that the block grant program, you know, is based in regulations that are um, older, decades old, many decades old. But um, so I think some of it is, you know, as a first time applicant, they're just not familiar with that. So the next time around, if they apply, hopefully we've helped them so that they can, um, you know, strategize and, you know, develop a proposal that can be more competitive. So I don't, you know, I think saying that we just fund one new organization every year may not make sense because I, sometimes I don't think they're ready. Um, but I, you know, yeah, I think, you know, the committee has talked about, is there ways to make it, whether it's more equitable or just, you know, fund different activities um, at some point. And so, you know, there's probably a few different ways to do that. Um, One thing I would say about the, the, the categories is that, I mean, obviously I'm not as experienced as, as many of you, but so many of them seem to me to cross a lot of categories. And so how would we categorize them or would we ask the agency to say, 
to declare a category in which they want to be considered. I mean, that feels challenging to me to categorize them when there's just such a, because all a lot of them, my perception is that they are looking, they're scanning the horizon and they're increasing what needs to be addressed within their program. And so they may shift their own mission, not mission, but specific activities. So I, it seems to me if we really want to fund some new ones, we might think about, you know, only funding agencies for X number of years and then having a break. So much to consider. Um, Nat, you were going to get your hand up? Yes. Um, I, I also, I love the idea of kind of new ideas and the mobile market was a great idea. I loved what they were doing. And the things that I struggle with is, I guess, twofold. One is that we had this limit of, you know, five social service projects. So that makes it really hard for us, you know, to, you know, give a small amount seed money to something new that's starting up. So that's frustrating. Um, the second is I think we have a requirement that the proposal be either a new activity or a continuation of an activity that we already funded. So unless I'm reading this wrong, Nate, you can tell me, but if, um, if we're funding someone you know, for a number of years and then we stop funding them, then when they reapply, is, does it have to be a new program? It's not really a continuation of something because we stopped funding them. So, you know, does that make it difficult for an agency if we stop funding them? They have to come up with something totally new, something different to get money again. Uh, yeah, no, I can respond. I think you know, the regulations say new or expanded or continued. So I think, and then there's a there's a you know a supplanting requirement too that if they receive state or or federal funds 12 months prior to the application, they can't use, you know, they can't, you know, take the block at money and, and put it in place of their other funding. So I think it does, you know, it can be difficult for an organization that receives block grant money, say for, um, you know, a few years and then not to receive it because they may have already built some, you know, some program. And so then they either have to reduce their program, right, um, you know, staff or whatever. And then when they apply for block grant money, it would be an expansion again or they could say that they filled the gap in funding and it's a continuation of what was an expanded program. I think there's ways to, so they don't have to, you know, um, you know, have this kind of literal interpretation, but um, I do think sometimes, you know, com communities um, say too, that they like getting block grant money, at least some every year, because you can plan, right? If you get some planning money one year, then the next year you can do the construction or the, the capital project. But if you get money, um, somewhat sporadically and infrequently, right? Inconsistently, it's hard to actually do projects because you don't know when you'll receive funding next. And so, um, you know, the mini entitlement program is a three-year designation, for instance. And I think DHD, you know, realized that it's nice to have that window where communities can have three years of, of fund, of, you know, of known funding so that they can then plan for projects. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the difficulty is if we look at the last five years, it's a, you know, there's, you know, not as, you know, there's a limited number of activities that have been funded um, or, you know, similar activities. The, the other thing I was gonna just raise and cause I'm not quite sure what the best way to do it is, but obviously we have two empty spots, I guess on the committee. Um, and I wondered what the process is whether there's outreach done to bring in um, a diversity of voices um, and it would seem to me that this would be a great committee for somebody who is low income for diversity of race of ethnicity of people who used some of the programs that were funding and how best to outreach to fill positions other than those of us who just randomly look up to see what positions there are in Amherst that we can help with. That's good. We'll, I'll remind the town manager's office. They sometimes put out a press release and do some, you know, there's some public outreach. Um, you know, I think the difficulty is if someone is associated with an organization, then they may need to recuse themselves during the discussion and review. So, 
you know, if you, I think, you know, the irony is, right, if you have someone with experience and say they, you know, they volunteer, you know, or, or is associated with a, a group that submits a proposal, then they are in a tough position. Um, but yeah, no, I think we can, um, I know the town manager's office works to recruit, you know, a kind of a, you know, diverse set of, um, of volunteers. So we can, I had spoken with Angela a while ago and they were looking at it, um, filling vacancies. And I said, well, this was right, you know, in, in September. And I said, you know, it's not worth it at this point because the proposals do, you know, and the best time to do it would be, you know, now actually, right. Would to be get someone on board by January. So we'd have new members when we start the next process. So I think it's a good reminder to, to, you know, pick up on that. And now that I've done all that talking, I really do have to go. So I'm going to sign okay, up. Thank you so much for all. Thank you so much for these suggestions. And I think there may be, maybe we should have another discussion sometime in January to kind of, I don't know, expand upon what everybody suggested tonight. It's late, it's Thursday night, everybody's kind of like done. But um, I love that everybody's been thinking about this because um, now's the time to create change before we go into the next funding cycle. Uh, Lev's had her hand raised, Gail. If... Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't see it. I love you can unmute yourself. Here, Lev, I'm going to promote you to panelists just because we're not hearing you. Maybe that'll help if we. Great. Hi. <laughs> um, sorry, what I was trying to say when you can hear me was, is, it, is this appropriate? Are you, is public comment allowed at this juncture in the meeting? Yeah, we're still in a public hearing. You know, although the committee has been doing most of the discussing, <laughs> you cannot okay. jump in. Um, so I want to recognize, I so appreciate the committee's consideration of this issue because I think this is an incredibly important like set of questions in philanthropy right now that you all are grappling with in terms of how does one define community impact and how do you define readiness for funding and does somebody I just had a conversation with a old friend who's a colleague in New York talking about this like long and involved process with a program officer of a foundation for this new innovative program that they were doing. And then at, like the very last stage, they were like, sorry, you don't have enough data yet. Right. And they're like, of course, because it's new. So I just, I want to commend the committee for grappling with this. Um, and I also want to acknowledge sort of the potential, I, I can't pretend to be like an unbiased subject on this as a current recipient of funding. But I guess the the two key pieces that really come out for me as I'm listening to you all are that um, first on the issue of new programs is that um, I think that it would be really important if the committee wishes to dedicate specific resources towards new programs that that be identified as programs meeting new needs or programs doing things in different ways. Um, so while, for example, while the mobile market has been, is was a new applicant to CDBG, they are a part of a very longstanding organization. Um, and so I guess I would just, as a community member would say like, yes, they're doing something totally incredible and I'm an enormous fan of the mobile market and their impact has been amazing. What they've done is like really, really remarkable. And should that be considered differently than for example, it sounds like um, I heard Wei Ling mention earlier about ACC is doing a new program around support. I believe it was around raft assistance or some other assistance. And so both of those are in fact new programs that are a part of longstanding organizations. Um, so I guess I would just encourage the committee to recognize that there may be, whether or not something is new to CDBG doesn't necessarily change whether it's a new organization um, and that a very longstanding organization can still do new and different things to meet new needs and need that sort of like startup funding to enable that process. Um, but the other piece that I would just ask the committee to consider, and I mentioned this, I've mentioned this a couple of times in my comments, is that 
I think that it's really important um, for any nonprofit. We don't exist to exist. Our function is not to be around. The function of a nonprofit is to serve a specific mission, is to have impact on against some measurable objectives of what its mission is there to do. And so um, I, I would just encourage the committee to feel really strongly that it's, I don't see community funding as a matter of sort of doling out cookies to those that are more and less deserving. It's about, I believe that the community development block grant funds have come to the town of Amherst in order to achieve a set of objectives as laid out by DHCD and then as determined by the community priorities and that this committee's role is really to determine how best to allocate those funds in order to meet those objectives. Um, and I think that's important in a lot of levels. I think that's important in terms of the capacity to support new organizations that may not have as advanced administrative structures, but can still provide really incredible impact. And I think that's important in terms of providing a, you know, an organization that's been around for a long time, but hasn't necessarily met CDBG reporting requirements, but can really provide that impact and what support could be provided. And it also could be a metric around you know supporting an organization that has been a CDBG funded program and continues to provide that impact. But I feel like it's this, I guess I would just encourage a conversation that is less about like the organizations and is about the impact for Amherst residents who are living with low and moderate incomes. Um, and I have no doubt that that's where the community's like, in or this committee's interests are totally at heart. But I guess just kind of like from the nonprofit perspective, um, I feel like you know, to some extent, right, like we're all businesses, we're all trying to like meet our, I mean, we're nonprofits, but like we're trying to figure out how to meet payroll and how to, you know, whatever, buy the stuff we need to buy and, you know, pay our electric bill and get to the end and all of that stuff. But there's also this piece of like, we're here to do this broader impact. And that I think is really what we should all be measured against and held accountable to by the community that if we're not providing that impact, then we, then those resources need to be directed to um, another entity who can. I just want to respond quickly by just saying, I think that um, our scoring mechanism allows us to be objective about the proposals. And I think this year we had that lengthy discussion about how important it was to fund different entities, you know, youth, um, food insecurity, um, folks facing homelessness and we had that really trying discussion and ended up not funding the mobile food pantry because we wanted to have an array across the board. So given your last kind of summation, I think that we're trying to do that too so that we feel like we're doing our job in supporting all the different um, needs or that people have addressed in their um, the needs in the community. But I thank you for your comments. So um, should we plan on meeting um, again to kind of hash out some of these suggestions that were made this evening? Yeah, you know? I think you know, we, to, we could have a motion to close the hearing. We could just, you know, we could wait to see if there's any more comments. There's still a few members in the audience. And then, um, yeah, and I think we could then set another meeting date um, you know, we could tentatively have some, you know, in, in you know, early to mid January, I guess. At whenever the committee, you know. Do you want to make a motion to adjourn this portion of the meeting? So moved. Nate, did you, Nat, did you second? Okay. Did you get those? That, do we have to record that on paper or recording it is sufficient? I'm Nate. taking that. I'm taking that. Oh, thanks. Me too, man. <laughs> Okay, so do we want to propose a, a date or do you want Ben to send out a Zoom with a couple of options or what's the best way to look at the next um, first meeting of 2022? I thought it was helpful when Ben sent out by email that that seemed to work well for us, it seemed to me. With a couple of choices. <laughs> Since Lucas? Becky is not here right now, so. Yeah, Lucas, right. you with that too? Yeah, uh, well, 
I'll maybe throw out some Thursday options. Okay. Yeah, I have a, the only thing I can't do the third and I can't do the 19th. I'm sorry, those are just hard days for me. <laughs> you know that already, okay. that's amazing. The, um... My wife's birthday is the 19th. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, I'm self-preservation. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, and I think rounding out this committee with folks that don't um, look like us would be really helpful as well. We'll try. Okay. Um, what's left, Nate? Oh, Sarah just raised her hand. Okay. Hey, Sarah, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I am the new small business program manager for Valley CDC, but I know that you keep mentioning today, you know, rounding out your committee for those that you know, may not be in the same situation as yourself. But I would encourage you to actually look at the organizations that you are already donating or the grants are being used for. Um, and speaking with some of the members of, that actually access those funds. So for example, speaking to a small business that has received counseling through Valley CDC, um, one of the business owners might be interested in participating on this committee or somebody from a housing situation or anybody from um, Amherst Survival Center who currently receives um, things from uh, the pantry there as well. So there's just other ways of reaching the community in which actually either accesses funds that are available through CDBG or um, might have connections through that. So that's just something, a way of thinking about outside of the box here a little bit more. Thanks. And Nate, what about like conflict of interest like you mentioned previously? Um, it may or may not, depending on how their, you know, their continued participation in the program. Um, okay. Or even putting up, you know, notices at places where people show up, you know, right. like the Survival Center, like Amherst Community Connections. So, I mean, some people are getting aid online and some people are getting, aid, you know, help in person. So maybe that's an option as well. Would yeah. it be appropriate to um, invite directors of the various agencies to recommend people or oh. approach people? Or is that a conflict of interest? I think I'll let the town manager's office do, you know, we have public outreach officers for the town. And so we can make, you know, let, you know, let them know that we're looking for two members and that we can, you know, I can, Ben and I can work with them on, in terms of outreach methods and strategies, but I'll, I'll leave it to them. Okay, great. Any other business? No, not at this time. Okay, well, thank you everybody for your participation. Um, committee members, presenters, nonprofits, staff, Ben and Nate. And then, so Ben, you'll get to us with a couple of options for January. Correct, yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care, thank you again, everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.